All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, so today is the second lecture on our sequence of complex analysis. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of motivation for why we're doing complex analysis, uh, because it can get a little bit dry, especially in the middle, before you learn how to do really cool things. So, so there's a number of reasons. We're going to be able to use complex analysis to solve really interesting partial differential equations. So for example, if I have um, like a disk of metal and I'm applying some kind of a fixed temperature at the boundaries, then I want to find not only the uh, steady state temperature distribution at time infinity, but I might also want to figure out what are the transients in the temperature profile over time as it equilibrates. And this is the kind of problem that we need complex variables to solve. Okay. Um, Complex analysis is also just good for you to know. It's like knowing calculus. Even if you haven't taken a derivative or an integral in a long time, it's still good to know the general formalism of how to deal with complex variables and the complex plane. Um, I don't do complex integrals on a daily basis. I haven't done one in years. Um, but it's still fundamentally important to know kind of how math generalizes from real numbers to complex numbers. Uh, and it is really important if you want to do PDEs by hand which a lot of you are going to do um, at some points during your career. So that said, complex analysis can be both very deep and interesting and also somewhat boring. Um, and so what I like to tell people is when you're studying math that you're not exactly sure why you're learning it or what it's good for yet, which is true of a lot of fields of math, I think of it like uh, eating your broccoli or going to the gym. Like, not everyone loves doing it, but it's definitely good for you, uh, and it lets you do things that you want to do later. Okay? So, unfortunately, that's a terrible preface to call this the broccoli lecture, but, but this is actually some pretty cool stuff. Um, so I want to just start out with an example of complex numbers arising in everyday life because it's kind of interesting. Or at least maybe not in everyday life, but in science fiction. So who can tell me why physicists say that we can't go faster than the speed of light. Like, what are some common reasons why we can't go faster than the speed of light? Right, people used to say that you couldn't go faster than the speed of sound, but they were full of it, because horses couldn't go faster than the speed of sound. But that, they had no good physical reason to believe that. What's our physical basis to think that you can't go faster than the speed of light? Yeah. Right, so there are essentially changes to the geometry of space and time that make it so you would need infinite amounts of energy, time would slow down infinitely slow, and your mass would grow infinitely large. So the large mass is the cool part, at least for me. So you have this uh, Lorentz dilation factor where you have your mass, if you're going super fast, so your fast mass is equal to your rest mass if you're going zero speed, like basically our mass is right now, divided by 1 minus your velocity squared divided by the speed of light squared. Okay? So this is, uh, there's also a similar term for time and for energy. Um, C is the speed of light. And it's super fast. So the basic idea is that as your velocity approaches the speed of light, this fraction approaches 1, and your rest mass gets divided by 0, and your mass blows up to infinity, which is not good, right? So this is one of the reasons why physicists say that you can't possibly go faster than the speed of light, or at least we can't go faster than the speed of light. But are there any loopholes to this? You're massless. Uh, if you're massless, you could maybe go the speed of light. Okay, uh, what are some other loopholes? So I like that, so let's think about messing with the mass. What other things could happen to the mass to make you go faster than the speed of light? Sorry? Um, I was going to say I'll keep your drive. Okay. I know they're talking about systems that will warp space-time so that with respect to local space, you'll be stationary, but 
the bubble is going to travel at the speed of light. Okay, so this is Star Trek stuff. What do they call those particles in Star Trek? Tachyons. So, so a physicist in 1965 proposed that you could... Okay, so we mere Earthlings are limited to velocities that are less than C, because if we passed through C, our mass would blow up. But what if there are imaginary people with imaginary mass, and their velocity is always fixed at greater than the speed of light? You could potentially have that, and you would have one minus something bigger than one, so a lot, like a negative number, so you would have an imaginary mass, and you also couldn't go through the speed of light. Like You would also be bounded to always be faster than the speed of light, because if you went lower or equal to the speed of light, you would have infinite imaginary mass. And so these uh, hypothesized particles go faster than the speed of light always and have imaginary mass. And just recently, there was a paper published. This isn't a new idea. This has been around for quite some time, that neutrinos may, in fact, be tachyons, because it actually is more consistent with our measurements um, if they are going slightly faster than the speed of light. Um, it's a little bit dubious. I don't think many people believe it. But it's an interesting idea. So this is just one place where complex numbers could come up in physics. Um, there's lots of others. So if you look at the Schrodinger equation for lasers um, and optics, you have lots and lots of imaginary uh, complex functions that are important. We're also going to get complex functions in heat transfer, and wave equations, like when you play guitar, lots of um, complex functions come out of that partial differential equation. OK, so now we're going to talk about math. Um, so last time we saw some complex functions. And for the most part, they were like what we're used to seeing. You, know, you could have sine of a complex variable z. You could have z to the power n. Um, we didn't talk about square root of z, but we'll talk about that a little bit today. And so something that I want to talk about is um, what are called roots of unity. And this is a nice intuitive way to understand why some functions of the complex plane are multi-valued. They have multiple function values for a, a fixed single value of z. So uh, if I said, what is the square root of plus 1, what would you say? Right. Not just one, but plus or minus one. OK, so we know that there are two solutions to this square root function. And each of them, when squared, gives us one. OK? So if I draw these in the complex plane, I have the point plus one, and I have the point minus one. OK, so the square root uh, of one has a radius which is still one. But the first kind of principal square root has a phase angle of 0. And the second square root has a phase angle of pi. Okay. And the idea is if I wanted to take, so let's say I wanted to take the third root of plus 1. Are there any guesses for how I would figure out what the third root of plus 1 is? Sorry? One with a phase angle of 2 pi? Uh, so one with a phase angle of 0 would, would be one of the solutions. Okay, So you'd have 1 with the, prin the principal cubed root of 1 is going to be 1, just like the principal square root of 1 is 1. And you're right, that's also the same as having a phase angle of 2 pi. What did you say? OK, so I could take this. You know, this is also equal to 2 pi or 4 pi or so on. So I could take this phase angle and divide it into thirds. So I could have my uh, theta equals 2 pi thirds and theta equals 4 pi thirds. And the idea here is, remember, if I take complex numbers, if I have you know, z equals r e to the i theta, and I take z to the third power, I get my radius cubed, and I get e to the 3i theta. right? And the whole idea of a cubed root function is that it should be the inverse of the cubing function. So any one of the cubed roots of 1 
when I plug it into this formula, I should get 1 e to the, you know, 0, 0 phase angle. Or e to the 2 pi i, if you like. So what we can do is we can take 2 pi i and divide it by 3, and we get the first, uh, sorry, the second cubed root of negative 1. And if you verify, you have e to the, you have 1 times e to the i 2 pi over 3. If I take that to the third power, I get 1 e to the 2 pi i, which is just 1. So this number, when I cube it, I take my angle and I multiply it by 3, and I get back to 1. So does this make sense? When you take a complex number and you multiply it by itself, or you cube it or square it or whatever, you take its phase angle and you multiply it by the power that you're taking that variable to. So I have this phase angle, 2 pi over 3, and if I take that to the third power, then I get three of them, and I'm right back to positive real 1, radius 1, phase angle 2 pi. Okay, so this is one of the cubed roots of plus 1. This is the other one. You can verify that if I go around three times at 4 pi over 3, this is 1, 2, and 3. Right? If I take 4 pi over 3 times 3, I get two rotations. It brings me right back to positive 1. Now, I haven't proven that there aren't any other roots of positive 1, um, but that's something we'll do in a minute. Okay, questions about this before I actually write down the math more formally. Okay, what if I asked you to do the cubed root of negative 1? Okay, so what is the cubed root of negative 1? How would I, like, what's the general procedure for how I would figure this out? What's one of these solutions? Just some number. Negative 1. So negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Okay, good. So one of my solutions is negative 1. Uh, what are a couple of my other solutions? I mean, so this thing has a phase angle of pi. So my guess is that if I took something with a phase angle of pi thirds, then that would be a cubed root of negative 1. Because if I take that to the third power, I pick up, you know, pi thirds, 2 pi thirds, pi. And I'm right back where I want, which is negative 1. Another solution is down here. And notice that these are all kind of equally spaced, um, 120 degrees in each of them. And this one's at e to the i 5 pi over 3. Okay, so the roots of unity, or the roots of negative unity, or whatever, are always going to be equally spaced in phase angles. So the fourth root of 1 is like this. These are the fourth roots of 1. Uh, if I had the fifth roots of 1, then it would look like a pentagon. They would all have like 72 degrees between them or something like that. Um, and there's always exactly as many roots as the denominator of the fractional exponent. One, you know, this is 1 to the 1 over 4. So there's four roots of this. OK, a little bit interesting. Um, so maybe I'll just give you the formula for this, or I'll, I'll give you the basic idea of how you would obtain this. There's a homework problem where you're essentially taking functions to a fractional power. So you're going to have some function like z to the 
i root 2 or something like that. You know, this is some function of z. And I should tell you, the homework is probably going to come out either later tonight or early tomorrow morning. So you'll have some function z, which is like z to the i square root of 2. And I'm going to want you to take this function and write it as something like a plus i b, where a and b are real. Or I might want you to write it something like a times e to the i b, where a and b are both real functions. Okay. So the way that we would do this, if you have a general function uh, z to the a, So in the complex plane, we can always say that z equals e to the log z. This is a trick. So this is a trick to figure out why you have these weird multi-valued functions when you have uh, strange powers of a. So in the complex plane, we have z equals e to the log z. These are just inverse functions, so this is guaranteed to always give me back exactly z. And so if I take my function z to the power a, that's the same as e to the a log z. No problem. And so um, I'll do one quick example. So if I have an example where a is rational, like m divided by n, so for example, all of the cases we just did were examples where a is rational. Like the cubed root of 1, a would be 1 over 3. The fourth root of negative 1, a would be 1 over 4. Okay, these are rational exponents of my complex variable z. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this formula when this exponent a is a rational number. It's the, divide, you know, the division of two integers. Okay. So we have um, z to the m divided by n equals e to the m over n log z. Okay, that's e to the m over n. And remember last time we had an uh, expression for log of z in terms of the length of z and the phase angle of z. So we have e to the m over n log z plus the phase angle, which was i times the principal theta plus 2 pi k. And k could be any integer. You could plug in k equals 5 or 2 or 0 or negative 1. doesn't matter. This is still the log of z. So it's got a lot of you know, infinitely many possible phase angles it could have, or imaginary parts. And so I'm going to break this up into a uh, real part and then the complex phase part. Or maybe I'm going to break it up into the radius and the phase angle, because that's always a useful thing we want. We always want something like r e to the i theta. Okay. So this log of z, the length of z, I'm going to call this my radius. This is e to the m over n log of my radius just using r for the length of z, times e to the m over n i theta, times e to the m over n i 2 pi k. So I've got these three terms that build up into this function z to the power a. Okay? This is a purely real valued function. Log of a real number is a real number. M over N of a real number is a real number. And E to the, a real number is a real number. So this thing is, um, you can do some math. This is just E to the log R, which is R, to the M over N. OK? And then these uh, are also pretty simple. You have E to the I, M over N, theta p plus 2 pi k. OK, so this is um, 
this is a nice expression for the function z to a rational number. Okay, I take the radius of my complex variable z, and that radius is simple. I take that real number to the power m over n. Easy. But the angle, these, the angle of these roots of unity, for example, are given by this expression. Okay, so if I take, uh, let's say that a, say a equals one fourth. Okay. Then I would take e to the i over four times my principal angle of z, and then any additional two pi over four times k. So let's say I take a to the a equals one fourth, and let's say I'm taking the fourth root of positive one. So what's the phase angle of positive one? Zero. So theta p for positive one is zero. So I have e to the i over four, zero plus two pi k. Okay, and I can let's just try a bunch of k's. So for k equals zero, so this equals um, you know k equals zero, k equals one, k equals two, three, four, dot dot dot. So at k equals zero, I get e to the zero. Okay, for k equals one, I get e to the pi over two. E to the i pi over 2. For k equals 3, uh, for k equals 2, I get 4 pi over 4 is just pi. e to the i pi. Uh, k equals 3, I get 3 pi halves. And something interesting happens when k equals 4. So if I plug in 4 here, I have 8 pi divided by 4 is 2 pi. And I'm back where I started, i to the 2 pi, which equals um, e to the i0. So I have four unique angles. And then at k equals 4, I'm back to k equals 0. They're the same, the same angle. And if I plotted all of these, I would have, they all have radius 1 to the 1 fourth, which is 1. And they have angle 0, pi over 2 pi, and 3 pi over 2. 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. Those are my fourth roots of positive 1. Okay, These four numbers are my fourth roots of positive 1. And we use this formula to get them. Okay, So you could take the 19th root of 5 plus 7i. Shouldn't be any problem at all. You could find the radius and the phase angle of 5 plus 7i. And then you could go about taking the 19th you know, fractions of 2 pi. And you can get, essentially, for any complex number z and any rational power a, you can figure out easily what those roots of that, uh, that function are using this formula. Okay? The homework problem is going to be a little bit more involved. So you're going to essentially be looking at this basic, basic idea where you plug in z equals e to the log z into some function like this. OK? Any questions about this uh, roots of unity business? Can I comment on some factors? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, well, for example, in a complex in a differential equation, right, we're used to having things, um, let's see. So if I had something like um, x to the fourth you know, minus x equals 0, or x to the fourth plus x equals 0, I'm going to get a bunch of repeated roots of plus 1. And then I'm going to get a bunch of fourth roots of negative 1 here, right? all of my lambdas are going to be fourth roots of negative 1. And those fourth roots of negative 1, uh, I think it's this, maybe rotate it a little bit. Each of those is an eigenvalue. 
that has a real part and an imaginary part, some oscillation and some transient decay or growth. So for example, in differential equations, these roots of unity come up as your eigenvalues all the, all the time. So roots of polynomials are closely related to you know, roots of unity here. There's a whole field of algebra um, dedicated to thinking about which polynomials even have roots that you can write down by hand in terms of like square root of two and fifth root of pi and things like that. Um, and it all eventually comes back down to these roots of unity. So that's one, one practical uh, application. Okay, and so part of the reason I'm telling you this is because your functions can have multiple values. Remember in our logarithm function, um, in our log function, we had something like, um, in the z-plane, we had some r and theta. And when we take the log of it in the you know, w equals log z-plane, then we have a lot of different solutions of this, infinitely many. Okay, so the real part is equal to log of r, log of the radius. But then the imaginary part is equal to theta and theta plus 2 pi you know, i and theta plus 4 pi i, theta minus 2 pi, and so on. You have all of these solutions. Okay, so some really interesting things happen in the complex plane. Um, so let's say that this is the real part, uh, maybe the imaginary part, and the real part of z. And let's say that this z-axis is the imaginary part of log of z. Okay. So we're going to do a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is, let's say that I start at you know, z equals 1. So it has a phase angle of 0. It's a real number. And then let's say in the z plane, I just start making circles. I, start, I literally just take my z, and I go around in circles. OK? What happens to my function log of z as I go around in circles? Yes, yeah, some super weird stuff happens. I start at 0, phase angle of 0, and I increase to pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. But I don't go back to 0. Now I'm at 2 pi plus pi over 2, 3 pi, 3 pi plus pi over 2, 4 pi. And I keep increasing my phase angle. I'm not sure if I can draw this. But basically, I get this kind of spiral staircase looking thing that goes on forever in both directions. Okay? And this is kind of an interesting idea in complex variables. You, you know, these are real branches, uh, real kind of levels of this function log z. So there's the, pr the principal level, the principal branch from 0 to 2 pi. And then there's the secondary branch from 2 pi to 4 pi and 4 pi to 6 pi. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, um, but in the notes I have one page called branch points and branch cuts. And the basic idea is that sometimes we want to take this multi-valued function and we want to pick a branch, maybe from 0 to 2 pi. And we want to just define our function to have values between 0 and 2 pi. So when our logarithm you know, crosses 2 pi, we might want to start back at 0 again. This is a trick that we use in complex numbers so that we can take multi-valued functions and just isolate kind of a well-behaved piece of it or one of the output values. And we do this all the time. So for example, when I take square root of 1, oftentimes I'll just say it's 1. Sometimes I forget the negative one, because this is the principal square root. Just like 0 to 2 pi here is the principal logarithm. 
Okay, but there are more values of this logarithm, just like there's more values of square root of 1. Okay, I'm not going to harp on this because this isn't going to become important until a, you know, a little ways from now. But I do want you to be thinking, like, let's say that I'm doing uh, an integral in the complex plane, right? We, we found that it's really useful to do contour integrals. So let's say that I do some contour integral of some complex function around a closed circuit. Some complex functions, like the logarithm, if I do an integral around a closed circuit, I might pick up a factor of 2 pi. Okay, and this is going to be one of the most important ideas in complex analysis is that closed integrals in the complex plane can give you extra factors of phase, an extra 2 pi i, if my function has this weird multi-valued property. If it's something like z to the 1 half or log of z. So there are some weird functions in the complex plane that are multi-valued, that have lots of branches, like square root of 1 or fourth root of z or log of z. And when I integrate closed curves in the complex plane, I can pick up an extra 2 pi phase angle when I integrate. So that's what, all that we're going to talk about on Friday and Monday, but I just want to seed that thought in your heads. Okay? You can get this weird thing where you pick up extra phase angle. And so what I'm going to do today is show you, so these are weird functions. Maybe they're not just weird, they're very special functions and interesting functions where um, if you integrate over a closed contour that circles z equals 0, you pick up an extra 2 pi i in phase. Okay, these are very interesting functions where doing a closed integral of those in the complex plane gives you something like a 2 pi i. So today I'm going to tell you about the property that defines all of the boring normal functions that don't do this. All of the functions we're used to seeing. And this is really, really, really closely and intimately related to vector calculus, which we covered at the very tail end of last quarter. So remember that there were conservative vector fields. And conservative vector fields had the property that if I did a closed contour integral, then I would essentially integrate to 0. Okay, so if I had some you know, vector field f, and I did some you know, closed integral of f ds, I would get 0. So there's an analog in complex numbers, and these are called analytic functions f of z. Okay? Now, I've been kind of wrestling with how I want to introduce analytic functions to you, because you could take an entire 10 or 15 week course on analytic functions. It would be terribly boring. But I want you to know the most important properties of these functions, because it's really, really useful. So first, I'm going to tell you what they look like, what kinds of functions they are, they are because that's what matters. So these are things like polynomials, you know, z to the integer n. You know, z is a positive integer. Or, you know, sums of polynomials, z to the 3 plus z to the 4 minus z to the 5, things like that. They're functions that have convergent Taylor series. So they're functions where a Taylor series exists. So those are things like e to the z, sine of z, dot, dot, dot. Notice that the logarithm is funny. So log of z has a Taylor series most places, but where does it not have a Taylor series? 
So this has a Taylor series most places, i.e. z not equal to zero, but it doesn't have a con but not at z equals zero. So this function log z is an analytic function everywhere except at the origin, which is why if I take my integral around this function log of z, as long as my closed integral contains the origin, really weird stuff happens. But if I had a contour integral out here and it didn't contain the origin, it would integrate to zero because the function log of z is analytic out here. It has a Taylor series expansion. It defines a conservative vector field. OK, so these are the basic properties of analytic functions that I want you to know about. All I'm saying is that analytic functions are things that we're used to. Polynomials, things with Taylor series, nice, smooth functions that don't have bad singularities. So let's say that. So no, so you can't be analytic, not analytic, at or very near a singularity. So like 1 over z, not analytic. 1 over z squared, not analytic, at least at z equals 0. Because that's a big singularity. And when I say singularity, I mean something that like goes to infinity. Yeah? Uh, so yes, I mean z not equal to 0. Thank you. Yep. Good. OK, one last definition of what it is to be or not to be analytic is this is probably the most intuitive one, is a function is analytic if it's literally an expression of z as a whole and not just a function of x and y, the real and imaginary parts. It's a little bit weird, but I'll show you what I mean. So f is analytic if it's a function of z and not just a composite function of x's and y's. This is a little bit of a weird definition, but things like z, you know, z squared is clearly a function of z. I don't need to think about x and y. But I could have a function, so f, so things that are not analytic, sorry, I'll answer your question in just, just a minute. Um, at least at you know, z equals 0. 1 over z log of z, um, z to the, I think z to the 1 half is probably not analytic at z equals 0, but you should verify that. I'm going to put a question mark next to that one. Maybe that will be on the homework. Um, another really good one is let's say that I had f of z equals x minus iy. Okay, this is the complex conjugate function. Right? Z is x plus iy. The complex conjugate of z is x minus iy. This is not an analytic function because I can never write this as a closed form expression of just z. I need to write it in terms of the components of z, x and y. Not an analytic function. That's what I mean by this condition for. You have weird functions like this. Like you could cook up some function like x squared plus log of y minus square root of y divided by x. And chances are it's not going to be a closed form function of z. Those are not analytic. They're not analytically expressible in terms of z. That's what analytic means. OK, you had a question. Are functions analytic in certain regions, or are we describing the function as analytic? Functions are analytic in certain regions. Yes? And functions that are analytic in all regions are called analytic functions. So e to the z, sine of z, cos of z, polynomials are analytic everywhere. Log of z is analytic most places, but definitely not at 0, because it has a singularity at 0. Uh, I think that you know 1 over z is analytic at lots of places. No, it's not analytic, but it OK, we'll, we'll get into to the, the details of this later. And I'll give you tests where you can tell if a function is or is not analytic. So you'll be telling me soon whether or not these are analytic, because I don't remember. 
Okay. But these analytic functions are extremely interesting because what analyticity gives you is the ability to do calculus. It guarantees that you have some basic notion of smoothness, so I can do integrals and derivatives. I can do calculus on functions that are analytic. And notice that I've essentially said that the only things that aren't analytic are things that don't have Taylor series or have singularities. Right? You can't do calculus if you have singularities. And if you can't do calculus, then you probably can't write a Taylor series because it's written in terms of derivatives. So what I want to do is give you an example of a weird function that's not analytic. And then I'm going to motivate a condition for when something is analytic. OK, so a weird function not analytic. Is the complex conjugate. Okay, so I have f of z equals, okay, we're going to define it as z bar, and that equals x minus iy. And so what I'm going to try to do is compute the derivative of this function with respect to z. So I want uh, d, I don't want, I want df dz. And so we're going to try to take the derivative of this function with respect to z. Because if it was an analytic function of just z, I should be able to take the derivative with respect to z. OK, so this equals the limit, just like in calculus, as delta z approaches 0 of f of z plus delta z minus f of z divided by delta z. No problem. Just the definition of the derivative using limits. You should be able to do this. OK, and this equals the limit as delta z goes to 0 of delta z bar divided by delta z. That's what happens if you plug this into the function. You get delta z conjugate divided by delta z. But this thing has real and imaginary parts. So it equals the limit dot, dot, dot of delta x minus i delta y divided by delta x plus i delta y. Now, if a derivative exists in the complex plane, it should be the same no matter which direction I take that derivative, no matter which direction I let delta z approach 0. Right? Because it would be weird if it didn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative at the point 0, starting on the real axis. And then we're also going to take the limit starting on the imaginary axis. And we're going to see if they're equal. OK? So let's say that 1 is approaching on the real axis and 2 is approaching on the imaginary axis. So 1, we're going to take the limit as delta x goes to 0 of just this thing. If we start on the real axis, then we don't have these i delta y's. And that's limit of delta x over delta x equals plus 1. Okay. The derivative approaching from the right on the real axis is plus 1. Now let's take the derivative coming from the imaginary axis. So limit of delta y goes to 0. And now we don't have these delta x's. We just have minus i delta y divided by delta i delta y. And this limit is minus 1. This is terrible. This function has weird derivatives, weird limits from different angles. And it turns out that any angle you choose is going to give you a different derivative. OK? So this is kind of what I mean by not being analytic. This is definitely not analytic. Because I can't take a derivative. My derivative is not defined. OK? So a fifth condition of what it means to be derivative, to have a derivative, is that f is single valued, single valued, and has a finite derivative, f prime. I should have a derivative, and that derivative should exist no matter what direction I take that derivative. This is kind of the useful definition of analytic, because I can actually calculate whether or not this thing is true. 
And I might also have an additional condition. Every math book disagrees on this. I might also want this derivative to be smooth in a small neighborhood of that point where I'm defining analyticity. I like that one. I think it's nice to have smoothness. OK, uh, excellent. I have five minutes left, which is just enough to tell you uh, the most important thing in this lecture, which are the conditions so that you can tell if a function is or is not analytic. So again, this is called the cauchy riemann condition. Cauchy, anything with Cauchy's name is a big deal. Not quite as big a deal as Euler, but in complex analysis, he's the defined most things. And Riemann was, um, I think, Gauss's maybe only student. Um, OK, so for f of z to be analytic, what do we need? So the derivative must be the same regardless of which path I take. OK, uh, f prime must be the same regardless of path. Okay, if I don't get through all of this before the bell rings, I want you to read this carefully, and I'll finish it on Friday. OK, so we're going to say f of z equals the real part. It's a function of you know, x and y, plus the imaginary part, which is a function of x and y. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this limit. I'm going to say df dz equals the limit as delta x goes to 0 and delta y goes to 0 in any combination at any path I like of delta u plus i delta v divided by delta x plus i delta y. OK? So we're going to do the same thing we did in the last example. We're going to approach on the real axis. And then we're also going to approach on the imaginary axis. So if I approach on the real axis, then I don't have an i, y, and I only have u of x comma 0, v of x comma 0. So I have d, f, d, z equals lim of delta x goes to 0, delta u plus i delta v just divided by delta x. And this is partial u partial x plus i partial v partial x. u and v are functions of x. This is partial u partial x plus i partial v partial x. If I approach on the imaginary axis, I have df dz equals the limit of delta y goes to 0 of this. OK, and that equals, so 1 divided by i is negative i. So I have negative i partial u partial y plus partial v partial y. Now, what did we say has to be true for a function to be analytic? These have to be equal. Okay? I'm not, this isn't a proof. This is just a kind of cartoon. I'm not proving that if these are equal, then this is definitely true no matter what path you take. But trust me, it is. If I, ta if, if I take the derivative on the x-axis and I take the derivative on the y-axis and they're equal, then this function, you can take the derivative of any path at that point, and they'll be equal. So for these to be equal, I need the real parts to be equal and the imaginary parts to be equal. So I need partial u partial x to equal partial v partial y. And I need partial v partial x to equal minus partial u partial y. These are the Cauchy-Riemann conditions. They're extremely important. If I had thought of using color, I would have colors. And if these equations are true for a function z, a function of z, then that function is analytic. So what I want you to do is try this out for e to the z, and sine of z, and log of z, and show that those functions are analytic. The first two are analytic everywhere, and log of z is analytic everywhere except z equals 0. Okay. 
This is extremely useful. This is the condition that tells us that you can do calculus on certain functions. Okay, we'll talk more about that on Friday.